If life's a mystery, who done it? Welcome to Ye Gods. I'm Scott Carter. Today's episode encores my conversation with the delightful Julia Sweeney, who describes herself as an atheist and a cultural Catholic, and who, at one point in this interview, you'll hear me praise her for being wonderfully specific. Before we hit play, uh, when you hear Julia refer to Pascal's wager, Blaise Pascal was a 17th century French mathematician, philosopher, physicist, and theologian who proposed that since no one really knows if God exists, that we should bet our soul that he does. Pascal reasoned that if he does exist, we'll win by being rewarded for our faith, and if there is no God, nothing matters anyway. Whether or not God exists, what matters to me is that you now enjoy the provocatively original Julia Sweeney. That's my point of view, and I will go down for that point of view. And that is Catholic of me. That's what I feel like my mother's calling Catholic. You're so Catholic, well, you won't even give yourself the pleasure. Like, what she's saying is, you're so convicted to the death of what you think is right that you won't even have the pleasure of thinking the world is a magical place. That's one of the great things I got from Catholicism, is a conviction of belief. I just happen to not believe in God. Welcome to Ye Gods. I'm Scott Carter. My guest today, Julia Sweeney, is a source of delight to me. Some of you best know her from SNL, but others, myself included, think primarily of her one-woman shows. First, God said ha about her and her brother having cancer at the same time, a clear-eyed, compelling, often comic portrayal of a family in crisis. She then followed that up with Letting Go of God, a account of her spiritual journey from growing up in a large Irish-American, very Catholic family in Spokane, Washington. Then, as a thinking adult, she goes on a three-year spiritual journey of one comic, tragic episode of disillusionment after after another until she makes what I think Gwyneth Paltrow might call a conscious uncoupling with God. Because from Julia's perspective, she did not think that God existed, which I think any reasonable person would conclude that is the least one can expect from a deity. Her fans will be happy to know that there is a filmed but yet to be released third solo show, Older and Wider, and it is a pleasure to talk to you, Julia Sweeney. How are you today? Scott, that was very nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I've been binging Julia Sweeney. And oh, God. it is, it is well, it's incredible because the first monologue goes back decades. And it, I'm getting, I watch you evolve as a human being. And, and there are also accounts of the different members of your family. Yeah, that that, that come in and out through these different long stories. So first I want to establish, are you religiously pretty much where we last saw you at the end of Letting Go of God? That That is, God sort of like the ex. You're, you're not mad at him, but you just, you can still be friends, but it can never be what you once had growing up. I guess you could say it like that. Although, I mean, I just so don't believe in God. It, to me, it's just such a figment of my imagination. It's like a pretend friend that you'd have as a child. Like the closest I would say is that the, I do think the concept of God as I, as I defined it, is a useful tool. So, like sometimes I say to myself, "What would God want me to do?" And when I say God, I mean this character that was I created with the help of the Catholic Church and everything I read, who cares about you in the best way or knows everything or whatever it is. And what would that, what you know, kind of as a way to get into your, I guess you'd call your wiser, higher self. It's a useful tool to say, what would God want me to do in this moment? I would say sometimes I call on that just as an experiment. That's as probably as close as I get to being religious. And so when you're calling on the God character that you don't believe exists, what is it clarifying to you when you do 
offer this, it's either a prayer or a meditation, but you're offering something out. Do you feel you're getting clarity back? Yeah, sometimes. Any more than if you didn't specifically focus on what would God want me to do? No, I would say it's less and less useful. I can say, what's your best self say about this situation? I mean, like, the thing about God is it's imbued with all this knowing of what the future is going to hold or knowing what's in the hearts of people that we can't possibly know what's in their hearts or understanding the machinations of the past in ways that I couldn't possibly understand. All those things that you would attribute to a God, an all-knowing God, right? And so sometimes I just think it's useful to imagine that idea and ask how I would have asked in the past what should I do here, God? And I'm just trying to think, because I feel like I did that recently about something. Oh, because I'm in a frustrating situation about releasing this film of the last show. It seems like it's going to be working out. It's so boring. You can't believe it. But there have been these really difficult moments with it of not knowing what move to make, which has caused like sleepless nights. And that, and then I did try to think, what would God say? And then I thought, uh, God doesn't know because God doesn't know because there is no God. (laughs) Okay. So, but I feel like I did it and it was helpful, but I can't remember exactly. I'm trying to, I want it. I I feel like I want God to have a good moment here, but I just actually can't think of one. God has plenty of defenders. You need, you need not feel the burden of being his or their advocate. I feel like I'm defensive of God in a certain way that I am really defensive of God in, in that I think if there were a God, or if there is a God, that God would not care at all if people believed in him or her or whatever, or had, like, I wouldn't respect any God who required somebody to believe in the God. (laughs) I mean, I feel like to me, that's the telltale sign there is no God. It's just about a hierarchy display of power. Like, why would God care if I believed in him or not? And and I do feel like defending the imaginary God on that be beha- on that in that way. You know, like God doesn't care if you believe in him or not. God doesn't care because there is no God in me. But even if there was a God, why would he care? Why would he care that you acknowledged him or believed in him? Why would that be important? Right. Wouldn't it be just important that you're a good person? I mean, I guess if you're imagining a God that wants people to be good people, why wouldn't he just care that you're a good person? And the best way to be a good person, like somebody who does good for their fellow humans and doesn't believe in God is a such a superior person than somebody who does believe in God and then does good things. And that to me is so obvious that even if there was a God, I would think God wouldn't, he would like the people who didn't believe in him the most. And the the notion of the needy God, yeah, that needs to be worshipped twenty four hours, twenty four seven. It posits a pure God, yeah, who is course. not quite convinced of his own uh, omnipresence or omnipotence, uh, yeah. in in a way that if it were a, a a true God, you would think that God would be very secure in the knowledge that. I mean, the same God that would say, I am that I am, might be a God that would also be secure enough not to be needing people to be paying lip service. It's it's like that, like those initial cabinet meetings where Trump had everyone go around the circle yeah. of the table and not talk about how they were honored to be serving the American public in this very important role but simply talk about how honored they were that President Trump had chosen them. Well, I have a theory about that. Okay. That Trump was such a great way to watch our primate behavior in action. I think it's not, of course, I don't think there is a God, but I think it's all performative, not even for the top dog, the top God. It's performative for each other. You're showing the obeyance of each other to each other. And that, to me, is the signaling that's most important. That's what Trump wanted. Well, first of all, Trump is a crazy narcissist who needs people to compliment him. But I don't think it functions for that purpose. I think it functions to show other people that you've made these people submissive 
to the point where they are required to say certain things. So at a church, it would be certain prayers or certain, you know, God, you are the mightiest. It's really, let's, it's not about God needing to hear it. It's about you signaling to your fellow people that you are part of this group that all is putting this one idea above all else. And that's what's important about it. To continue this, your line of thinking, it's even in the Ten Commandments, I'm a jealous God. Yeah. Let me, let me yeah. own up. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, the, like, it's why, the John yeah. Lennon song, I'm, I'm a jealous guy. I, look, yes. I'm a jealous <laughs> God. I never meant to hurt you. I'm just a jealous God. What interests me in at the end of letting go of God, when you talk about your breaking up with him, you're, first of all, you are very gentle. You are very gentle and very And I was gentle in all my breakups, I have to say. And, well, and- Even and, with my ex-husband, I went and rented him an apartment before I came back and said, it's over between us and I'm going to escort you to your new home. I have not had that in a relationship, but I have, as an employer, found somebody I was about to fire a new job. Yeah. So that when I fired them, the end of the firing exercise was my handing them a name and a telephone number oh, and saying, call them, you will have a job this afternoon. <laughs> but but in this gentle breakup, you you say something like, it's really because I take you so seriously that I that I can't bring myself to believe in you. Yeah. I find that in so few words, you have contained a universe of contradictions, but a unified contradiction. Well, I don't know. I don't know what's a con This is the thing. I take it seriously. Like, people throw the word God around. I take it seriously. I'm sure there's other areas where I use words that I don't take that seriously. You know, I don't know. Right now, I would say the word diet. Does it mean what you eat in a day? Does it mean trying to eat a different way? You know, like... There's, we all have areas of expertise where words matter a lot. And then there's other areas where we might not be experts and we throw around words like everybody else does. And I just feel like when it comes to religion, I take it seriously. So when you say God, I want to know how do you find God? In what way do you believe in God? What is your conception of the universe? Even though most people in just casual conversation will bring up the word God all the time. And, and in some ways I really get it like poetically, I, you know, I always think God, God is such a great metaphor. Like I, I refuse to let go of God as a metaphor, but I happen to take it seriously because I believed. So I really believed. And then when I didn't believe, I really didn't believe. And so in this particular area of religion, I take the word seriously where there may be a million other areas where I, I throw words around, you know, like anyone else would and don't really analyze exactly why I say this word or that word. An example of that all throughout letting go of God is you'll get some question in your mind, something somebody says to you, it could even be offhand. And then in the next paragraph of your monologue, you talk about, so then I'm going to Tibet <laughs> or, or so then I'm going to the Galapagos Islands. And, it, and it's like, Probably the person who started you on some of these thoughts, like the two Mormon guys who come to your door at, at the beginning of letting go of God, had no idea that they were going to be starting you on this epic I know, journey yeah. that was going to lead you to the opposite of what they wanted from you. Although I don't even think they want that. I mean, like now I... I have such... I just see how religion functions as a social force. You know, like they... Do they really care if people are become, believing in God in the Mormon way? I think they grew up in a family, and this is what you did to kind of bind yourself to the culture they grew up in, and you go out and talk to people in a certain way so they have a common culture, and they get these boys or sometimes girls to do this at just at the time when their sexuality is peaking, and so it kind of makes them conform to Mormonism at a particularly crucial time. And then that functions that's worked very well for the Mormons. So I don't even think of them now as people who are trying to get me to believe. I just feel them more as like a cultural phenomenon that landed on my door. You talk about days before the two Mormons came to your door, you had this heal me, heal me, very intense religious experience 
that often you don't answer your door, and you did for these two that were coming to you, and their first words to you is, we have a message for you from, from God. God. I know. And, and it probably in your mind is connecting you to this strong yes. feeling that you got a yes. few days before. Okay, let me rephrase that. The connections that you're going to make and the community that you're going to have with these certain people is very valuable, whether you have to say you have to believe in something and whether you do or not. And that was the right place for them. It was the closest to them. And they had the people that they felt were most like them. Yeah. Therefore, that was a good thing to do. Exactly. And in the very last show, you have your mother saying to you, you're so Catholic, you won't even give yourself the pleasure of believing in God. And you make some comment like, there's some truth to that. Okay, but this is why I think that, because okay. I separate Catholicism from belief in God. Uh, Catholicism is a cultural force that has all kinds of different influences, you know, in it. It's a soup of influence, as all cultures are. And one of them is kind of strict taking things seriously. The Catholic Church, no matter where it's leading you, you must go where it's leading you. And even if it means you're in pain. And of course, I was really into hagiography. I was so, and still am, really interested in saints' lives and all that. So, of course, I admired people who went with where it what the world was heading or the ideas were sending them. And in their cases, these saints that I admired, that it meant that they were going to be burned on the rack or something. And they endured it because they had their conviction of what they believed, that doesn't necessarily apply to believing in God. That could be apply to not believing in God. So to me, yes, I do have a Catholic response to not believing in God. I have a conviction that no how, matter how uncomfortable it is, you stick with what you believe in. And what I believe is that we are not overseen by a loving God. And I, you know, all the things that are obvious, I think we're a species that have popped up like every other species and we're part of this incredible thing of life and we're an accident as much as the wildflowers are an accident and we live and die and I have my reasons for why we even have come up with religion but anyway that's my point of view and I will go down for that point of view and that is Catholic of me that's what I feel like my mother's calling Catholic you're so Catholic well you won't even give yourself the pleasure like what she's saying is you're so convicted to the death of what you think is right, that you won't even have the pleasure of thinking the world is a magical place. That's why I say that's a little bit true. It really is. That's one of the great things I got from Catholicism is a conviction of belief. I just happen to not believe in God, but I do have a conviction of belief. And I think that was instilled in me by partly by the culture I grew up in, Catholicism, and all the saints' lives, like my whole growing up, I had all the saints' lives. I just loved reading about these saints, and I admired them, Saint, all of them, you know, St. Lawrence and all, all of them who endured such physical pain for things they believed in. I admired that, and I still admire that. I just happen to not believe. So I think that's what my mom was referring to. But this is so incredible to me, and it is so compelling all during the time of letting go of God, my heart is going out to this person who is so committed. There's nothing glib ab about, uh, about your attachment to Catholicism. Yet, yet, do you share with Catholics who you talk to now, you know, I believe everything you believe except what you consider to be the main deal breaker I'm but not I with don't. that. Okay, but I don't feel that way because they don't believe everything I believe. I mean, the Catholics that I talk to now, first of all, there's a lot of Catholics I interact with who are great. You know, I have a I have a Monsignor in the Vatican and I we text each other. Like I have people that I admire. They're mostly incredibly liberal, but the people I interact with a lot are the right wing Catholics, as it just it's a hobby of mine to follow these people and harass them. And um, when you and say we harass. do not believe the same things. And yeah, I would yeah. say we do not believe the same things as even the liberal priests, even though I admire them because I think they've made they have a faith and they've interpreted their faith in a way that makes the world a better place. And to me, I don't care what you believe if that's true. It's like if 
if your belief in God is keeping you from murdering people, if your belief in God is helping you be kinder to others, who am I to say I don't want you to believe? But I find that most of it is is horrible. It's about loyalty and authority and adherence to authority mm-hmm. and an insistence on believing things that not only aren't are obviously not true, historically, they teach you to pretend to believe in things to be part of a group, which I think is the most dangerous aspect to it. So I fundamentally disagree with their worldview in every way, except for maybe be kind to people or, you know, life is precious and it's important. I I can go down all those roads as an atheist, but I I think fundamentally we disagree. But it doesn't mean I don't like some of these people. I mean, some of these priests I admire very much, and I I feel very, I feel like I'm one, I feel more like those people than I do about people who don't think about religion very much. So I always think I get along with people who are really, like, they have the courage of their convictions, you know, like, and so do I. I just have a different conviction than them. But this is so wonderfully specific. I really spent five years thinking about nothing else, you know, except for religion. And if I didn't believe how I was going to be a person in a world without belief. And it was a huge thing. But now I think if you took the topic of economics, for example, which is something actually I majored in economics, I actually care a lot about economics, haven't thought about it as, you know, like I wouldn't be able to speak with conviction about how I think economies of the world should be organized. I just happen to not be that way about religion, but I am that way about a bunch of other topics. And maybe you won't agree with this characterization, so let me just make it about myself. Okay. Before this near-death attack and this sense of, yes, there's a God, that I have not had shaken from me since 1987, what I've thought about is I've lived a lot of my adult life and even before that, one step outside of a circle. And the difference between being one step outside of the circle and one step within the circle is just two steps. And yet it's a completely different thing. Will you tell me what you think? What is the circle to you? The circle is a general belief in a God who, with increased effort, one perhaps knows better. But this God, is it a God separate from you that knows what's in your heart and soul and knows your past actions in the future? Is that what kind of God is this God? Well, it's it's not a God of any de- denomination. So, for instance, I do not call myself a Christian. I do not belong to a church, nor have I ever. I but you I could find, be a Unitarian. Well, I went to some Unitarian services, and maybe it was the place where I went. But they seemed so vague to me that that it seemed as though their intention was to not take any strong stand by which someone might be offended, to be generally agreeable where I where I thought I'm not being educated in any way or learning or I'm not being provoked to be considering something new by being here, which versus this conversation that I'm having right now, I feel like you are challenging me, not in a confrontational way. But just you're bringing up things in ways that I haven't thought of before. And the goal of this podcast is to be presenting different options for how people deal with the big questions of life. So let me just mention a few things that that are in your different monologues that intrigue me. One of them is you talk about Pascal's wager. Mm -hmm. Could you describe that to people? You know what? I almost can't. And it comes up so much, especially with my right wing Catholics that I talk to. But I would say that, well, I object to the whole idea of Pascal's wager. To me, it's like right. you're figuring out what's best for you. You're basically right. saying right. it's better to err on the side of belief because if you die and you didn't believe, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. But if you die and you did believe, you're going to go to heaven. But my feeling is if there's a God who can look into your heart and know if you're sincerely believing or not, are you? Are you even deciding to believe? Like, wouldn't a God, the God you imagined, see through your superficial fake belief and send you to hell anyway? So I don't even see how Pascal's wager works. Uh, Right. And I and I am completely (laughs) with you on the notion that if there is a God, that God cannot be bullshitted. Yeah. In other words, the notion like I know and I listened to a conversation you had with Penn Jillette, who's someone I've known for years and years. 
that people who are seemingly religious are doing it more for others than themselves. That's even what turns me off of using the term Christian. Well, I think now, I mean, it's just too long to get into how my theories of how religion developed, but I feel like, yes, you're performing it for other people. You are performing your religious belief for other people to see you do it. So they know you're part of the in-group and you're willing to do the things, whatever it ma- what doesn't matter what it is. You're saying these prayers, doesn't matter what the words are. You're kneeling and standing or whatever your particular religion is. And you're demonstrating to your fellow humans of your in-group, which is your church, that you're part of the group. It's just like you're a cheerleader doing the cheers. Like you're a cheerleader because you know those cheers and you're doing those cheers. And it's all about demonstrating to your fellow humans in this group so that you create a tribe, and a tribe is an incredibly useful thing for a human to be in. I mean, we evolved in tribes, and how did you know who was in the tribe? You spoke the same language, you said the same prayers, you believed in the same God. You did all these rituals, and you did all these things, and then when you're in battle, and things are bad, or there's a drought, or there's a flood, you're helping, you are all together, and you're all helping each other. It obviously helped people over time to be tribal. And so I just see all of that. I don't look at that negatively anymore. When I see people all chanting the same thing in a church, I think, oh yeah, they're all demonstrating to each other that they are part of this tribe. I feel uh I feel the opposite. <laughs> in in that and but I'm delighted to I I I am delighted to listen to you talk and also you you're sparking some notions in me where I feel like, oh, that, that's not my, we can have the, ex- you and I could be in the same place and have the exact same experience and take away two different things from it. In a way, you're part of the Catholic tribe. Oh, I'm I, absolutely culturally yeah, Catholic. Yeah. And, and yeah. I do not feel a part of any tribe. I don't feel a part. In fact, when I would go to church, I would usually go by myself, sit in a pew, not near anyone, which is not hard to find a remote seat in most churches these days. I am alone there and I'm and I'm kind of absorbing things or I'm talking to some people or I'm listening to some things, but I feel very much I don't have the tribal connection. You know, people find the belief systems that suit them. And I'm not even saying that that's not a good thing. I'm just saying that look a little deeper and you see what people get out of it. Yeah. Let me ask you a a couple of things, and I am so grateful for your time. You talk about growing up in times of stress, you would recite the 23rd Psalm. Yes. So is there something now, could be secular, whatever, that takes that place for you now? Well, not one thing specifically. Most recently, I've been reading a lot of Sylvia Plath poetry, and there was one and I don't even know it, but it's like, I listen to the old bray of my heart. I am, I am, I am. And I just, I often think of that. And really just different lines by writers or poets. Like, I do this meditation. Sam Harris has this waking up app. Then there's a morning meditation that I do three to four mornings a week. And it's only 10 minutes. But he is... In some ways, it's so annoying how much he's just focused on this one aspect of thinking about meditation that sometimes it's irritating to me, but it's all about trying to look for the one who's looking like that idea. So you're, you're closing your eyes, you're, you know, you, there's still a visual field even behind your closed eyes. And then you try to, at the snap of his fingers, turn the camera around and look at the one who's looking. And the point is that there is no one looking. I mean, there's just a, there's just a field of consciousness where certain sensations and ideas and physical sensations and the sense of a body are are coming up into consciousness and that's all part of one field. And even though it irritates me to no end how much he's hammering that relentlessly in every meditation, it has helped me feel calm at other times. You know, like when I had recently, because of my film, it's just boring to get into, but like how it's going to be released and I felt incredibly at wit's end and upset and I can feel myself wanting to go into a blame spiral of myself and the universe and everybody around. You know, I can feel it. I can feel the churn. And I do use this idea that you're just a consciousness 
that is having sensations coming to you. Right now, you're being bombarded with thoughts about this difficult situation with your career. But those are just thoughts. And there's also the, the wind on your face and the beat of your heart and the sensation of having a body and a head and looking out. And I understand that that's kind of fake and made for me to feel. And I also understand that it's real also. And that has helped me a lot, I would say, recently. His, you know, practicing that kind of get it's really getting out of yourself, you know, and your thoughts. Here's the last thing I want to ask you. Okay. about is I want you to imagine you you wake up tomorrow morning and you have been appointed by you it's first time everyone in the world has agreed on one thing everyone wants you to be the benevolent dictator of the earth for one day and you only have one ceremonial duty which is to tell them all one work of art it can be a movie or a play or a book or a song or a painting or a sculpture or anything that has spoken so much to you that you think if everybody else in the world heard this or read it or watched it or experienced it, it would make the world a better place. Okay, I have it. But it's my answer for this second, and in an hour it would be a different answer. Okay, Tokyo Story by Yasuhiro Ozu. Ozu is my favorite director, and he's a very Buddhist-minded director who made movies between 1920 and 1960 when he died. And they're family movies, and but they're really about life. And Tokyo Story is really, it's actually not my favorite of his movies, but it's the most profound about a worldview. And it's about these parents who are older in their 60s. And they go to visit some of their children in the big city. And their children are all awful. They don't appreciate them. They don't want them around. And they kind of end up wandering around Tokyo and going home and various things happen. And it's just, and there's a great line in it where Setsukahara, who's the one of the stars of it, and she's a wonderful Japanese star. She's with the daughter of one, the good daughter of this family of many children. And the daughter says, life is disappointing, isn't it? And Setsukahara says, yes, yes, it is. And I think... And now I, that seems like a negative thing, but there's something that is really, yes, life is, tr is disappointing, but we're all here trying to get by. We're going to get through it. And there's moments in that film where just watching the train go by is the best thing that you can do. It's just, I'm not very good at articulating why it's so profound to me, but to me, that's the movie I wish everyone would see and understand how beautiful it is. Well... <laughs> You are very good at articulating this. And I would also say that in your answer right now, the, the smile that you always have on your face and everything that you are generally describing in your monologues, which so I've been absorbing about six hours of Julia Sweeney this week. And even when you're describing the greatest heartache and disappointment, you are, there is a joy that you bring a, isn't life incredible? But I actually don't think that's me because I actually just explained. It's this you right husband. now. It's no, but you it's right an now. accident of my genetics. I, I'm a very ebullient, positive person. It's, it really has nothing to do with any good qualities of me. It's just something I happen to inherit. I mean, I yeah, I'm an optimistic person, maybe to a fault. And it makes me pleasant to be around, I guess, mostly, except when I'm irritated, obviously. But I think that's just an accident of personality. Like I... I'm around people who have very disgruntled personalities. I don't think it's in their control. I don't think, I think they're just that way. And I think I'm just my way. It's just, a, in that way, I was lucky. May I say that your way is more delightful to be around it than is. people that who, I are, agree with. who are disgruntled and who are a drag to spend time with. That will never be said of you, Julia Sweeney. Thank you so much, Scott. And now the sermonette I call In My Homily Opinion. Julia's description of herself as a cultural Catholic attests to the allure throughout history of Catholic traditions, ceremonies, and community, even to those who, like Julia, find no wisdom or comfort in the Bible or in the teachings or story of Jesus. One such notable figure was the great 19th century Irish writer Oscar Wilde. Here is a scene adapted from his only full-length novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. It was rumored of Dorian once, 
that he was about to join the Roman Catholic communion, and certainly the Roman ritual had always had a great attraction for him. The daily sacrifice, more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world, stirred him as much by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of its elements and the internal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolize. But he never fell into the error of arresting his intellectual development by any formal acceptance of creed or system. No theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself. He knew that all the senses, no less than the soul, have their spiritual mysteries to reveal. In 1900, Wilde self-exiled from Britain after two years' cruel imprisonment for gross indecency. Broken in body and spirit, attended public audiences with the Pope at the Vatican in Rome, and later, as Wilde lay dying in Paris, his lifelong Catholic friend and literary executor Robert Ross brought a priest to the seedy hotel room to initiate Wilde into the Holy Roman Church. It's a matter of speculation if Wilde was conscious during the ritual and he died soon after, at age 46. So can an unconscious person be saved by a ritual? Can the senses reveal spiritual mysteries? Please email me your true life story at yegodspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and until next time, be of good cheer.